I know every time we come together, I, I just uh, I, I want to make sure that I give opportunity. For in 2018, Bethel put up this very short video clip, which is the end of a sermon that Bill Johnson gave on Easter morning, and this is his altar call. Speaking of altar, I had to alter the sound and the look of this video in order to avoid a copyright strike from the incredibly lucrative publishing company, Bethel Music, which pays Bill Johnson $250,000 a year for 10 hours of work per week. Here's a little excerpt of my video that shows all the money they're making over at Bethel. He works 40 hours a week for Bethel Music, according to this Form 990, and his income adds up to $157,458. I'm not a theologian, I'm a prophet, so I can say things that aren't even scriptural, and you just like, Madre, yeah. But let's not forget, oh yeah, can't forget this guy, Bill Johnson. He's a board member. He only works 10 hours a week for Bethel Music. Not really a lot of time. He doesn't sing, he doesn't write songs, he doesn't play an instrument, but he makes $250,544. For people to know what it is, to, to love God, to have a relationship with God, to be forgiven, to be forgiven, to be what the Bible says, born again. It's changed from the inside. It's not an external discipline that changes. We can't change that stuff. It's, it's he who changed me. And so what I want to do is I just want to give a very simple opportunity for anyone in this room that would just say, Bill, I don't want to leave the building. I don't want to leave the property. Until I know I'm at peace with God, till I know I've been forgiven. Till I know that I've been brought into his family. By doing this, you're saying, Bill, I want to be a disciple. A disciple? A disciple is a learner, but Bill is a terrible, unbiblical teacher, so you'll be learning everything wrong. If you make a decision by raising your hand at Bethel, you'll be indoctrinated into the false signs and wonders theology of the New Apostolic Reformation. And the NAR is really just a retread of the false latter rain teachings that were rejected by the Assemblies of God back in 1949. Here's a booklet. I'll leave a link to this PDF in the description of the video you're watching right now. They actually made a resolution condemning the teachings of the New Order of the Latter Rain Movement. This is back in 1949. Let's take a closer look. Resolved that we disapprove of those extreme teachings and practices which, being unfounded scripturally, serve only to break fellowship of like precious faith and tend to confusion and division among the members of the body of Christ. And be it hereby known that this 23rd General Council disapproves of the so-called New Order of the Latter Rain, to wit, number one, the overemphasis relative to imparting. Most impartation that you've ever believed for right now you're going to impart to each other. So you're going to take it, you're going to put it on somebody else's head and watch and then say, more Lord. Whoa! More Lord. Everybody, place, place that anointing, that crown, that gift upon someone else's head. <laughs> Keep praying. Every single one of you, impartation, legacy, 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 increase your glory. More, Lord. Try it again, try it again, try it again, try it again. More, Lord. Fire. There's fire. Place it on their heads. Find somebody. I think he's got it. Shake a baba. Fire. Place it on another one's head. Fire. Shh. Just to be as clear as possible, the Assemblies of God is the largest Pentecostal denomination in the world. It started in 1914, and in 1949, they condemned this impartation business. But here we see Bill Johnson. He's in the upper right corner. And then you see Heidi Baker, and then you see her husband, Roland Baker, imparting something that is not of God. Legacy! Legacy! greatest thing you've ever seen in your life. Prophesy over them ten times. 
Start to prophesy over him. Start to prophesy over him. Start to prophesy over him. Let's look at point number one again. The overemphasis relative to imparting, which is what we just saw, identifying, bestowing, or confirming of gifts by the laying on of hands, and prophecy, which is what you just heard Heidi Baker talking about. Start to prophesy over it. Now briefly, let's look at point number two from this 1949 document. The erroneous teaching that the church is built on the foundation of present-day apostles and prophets. In 2001, the Assemblies of God further clarified their teachings about apostles and prophets, and specifically about the so-called fivefold ministry. They conclude this position paper with this quote down at the bottom here. It is difficult to escape the conclusion of Dietrich Mueller. Quote, one thing is certain, the New Testament never betrays any understanding of the apostolate as an institutionalized church office capable of being passed on. The reason I'm bringing this up is because Bethel Church used to be part of the Assemblies of God. They left the Assemblies of God when Bill Johnson wanted to introduce the radical, very disturbing teachings he learned from the Toronto Blessing. Even though Bill Johnson and Chris Valentin and the other leaders at Bethel often portray themselves as just plain old Pentecostals, historically, that's just not true. If you listen to what they actually teach, it's just not true. And when it comes to articulating and clearly explaining the gospel in a short little message like we see here, Bill Johnson really doesn't know how to do it. To be a disciple of Jesus. I want to follow him. Notice that the emphasis is on what we will do. It's us making a commitment to God. But it's not us standing before God as guilty sinners asking for his mercy. No, it's us saying, hey, God, we're going to join your team. This is a works-based sort of salvation message. And him alone, if that's... Anybody in the room, I just want you to put a hand up. Just by putting your hand up, you're saying, Bill, that's me. I don't want to, I don't want to leave the building till I know I'm at peace with God. Any, anybody at all, whatever you Yep, wonderful. Anyone else? Uh, thank you, I see it. Anyone else? I don't, I don't want to leave until I know I have found peace with God. And I'm forgiven this sin right now, forgiven this sin right now, forgiven this sin right here. Wonderful. So Bill doesn't introduce the word sin into the gospel equation until after they've already raised their hand. He's throwing it in like it's an afterthought. Let's take a look at the second chapter of Acts, which is probably the passage of the Bible that charismatics like the most because they like the first part. They like Peter's sermon when he talks about the uh, Spirit being poured out on all flesh and maybe even the idea that they get to act drunk. But in reality, Peter gave a very, very convicting sermon. And when he was done with his sermon, I'm not going to read the whole thing. I encourage you to do that. This is what the people said. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Nobody in the audience that morning at Bethel would have said anything like that to Bill Johnson. If you want to know what Bill Johnson thinks about repentance, all you need to do is read what he has said in one of his very famous books. This is one of the most shockingly ignorant things I've ever heard from any so-called pastor, ever. And yet, he's famous. He's influencing thousands of churches around the world. Let's read together, shall we? Renewing the mind begins with repentance. Jesus said, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. To many Christians, repent refers to having an altar call, where people come forward and weep at the altar and get right with God. That is a legitimate expression of repentance, but it's not what the word repentance means. Now he's going to explain what repentance means, and he's going to totally make something up out of thin air. R-E means to go back. Pent is like the penthouse, the top floor of a building. Repent, then, means to go back to God's perspective on reality. That's not what the word means, though. You can't just make stuff up, Bill Johnson. Has anybody ever bothered to tell Bill Johnson that they didn't have penthouses because they didn't have skyscrapers at the time the Bible was written? And even if there were penthouses in ancient Israel, it wouldn't make any difference because pent is not the same thing as a penthouse. You can't just take a part of a word and apply it however you want. On top of that, none of these original writings were written in English. So even if there was such a thing as a penthouse in ancient Israel, and even if it was the whole word, which it's not, it doesn't make any difference because it wasn't written in English. 
If you want to know what an English word means, you just look it up in the dictionary. And if you want to know a little bit more about where the word came from, its origins, you look at one of these. This is a etymological dictionary. I got this at a thrift store th for three bucks. Maybe somebody could uh, buy one of these for Bill Johnson and send it to him. Let's look at the word repent. Look at the definition from the Oxford Dictionary. To feel sorrow for what one has done. To rue. And rue is just another word that basically means the same thing. To be sorry for. But taking a quick look at this definition, you see nothing about going up to the penthouse again to get God's perspective. He just completely made that up. Now remember, in the time of Jesus, when the New Testament was written, there was no English language. It hadn't even developed yet. They used Aramaic and they used Greek. And the Bible itself was written mostly in Greek. Peter then to them, repent. There's the Greek word right there. I'm on this free Bible Hub website. That particular version of the word repent only occurs two times, Acts 2.38 and Acts 3.19. And in both instances, it's referring to turning away from your sins. It is specifically a word that relates to sin. When the Apostle Peter was talking to the crowds in both chapter 2 and chapter 3, it caused people to feel terrible about the sin that they were now made painfully aware of. And they asked, what should we do? And he said, repent. He didn't say go up to the penthouse and get God's perspective on things. He said, repent, turn away from your sins. This is what Bill Johnson does not say in this Easter message. So when the people raise their hand and respond to this basically non-gospel gospel message, the crowds at Bethel applaud them. Beautiful. Whoa! Did you hear that? Did you hear that? Hey! 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 Hey!